Okay, so yeah, here we go. All right, so Peter, thanks again for being here. Uh, hopefully, we don't have any more technical difficult difficulty, <laughs> but if we do, we'll figure it out. But uh, again, just you know, thanks for being here, um, and just so the audience kind of gets a little bit of a background of who you are and what we might be talking about today. You know, you're an author, a speaker, and also you're a master in professional communication. That's right. Yeah. That's a that's a big mouthful. Uh, all, all I all, all I do, Chris, and it makes it makes my mother laugh every time I tell her because my mum says, "Peter, what do you do for a living again?" And I say, "Mum, I I teach people to talk to each other," and she says, "And they pay for that." And I go, "Yeah, yeah, they do," and she just breaks into laughter. She thinks it's hilarious <laughs> because because for her it's just like a such a natural thing, and it was it's her. It was her fault. It was uh, her original guidance when I was a kid that really got me onto this track. Because uh, I, I was a, I was a kid that was really shy, wanted to be in my room reading books, and we had a lot of relatives. I mean, my mum comes from a big family, and she's very close to her brothers and sisters. So every Sunday we'd have uncles and aunties and cousins coming over for a big lunch, and I just wanted to be in my room reading my book. Uh, I wasn't nasty. I wasn't anti-social. I just was very introverted. And she said, "I'm going to come out and talk to people." And 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 I eventually did with her encouragement. And I just found that if I if I sat with my uncle, my uncle Harry, who I, who I loved, I just asked him questions. He told me these great stories, and I thought this is really cool. I'm learning a lot. I really love his stories. They're really funny, and that sort of got me thinking from a young age that maybe there's there's something in this conversation piece that's uh, worthwhile pursuing. So, so you knew you were a shy kid, and that is that kind of what the motivation was that hey, I want to start learning to communicate and put myself out. Yeah, there. exactly, exactly. And I, I realized that uh, I, I guess I didn't really understand it then because I was only what five or six years old. But what I started learning was that if I asked questions to people, I would learn a lot, and they would often never ask me a question back. <laughs> they would just tell me stuff, uh, and I would learn things, and they would like me. And it, it took the pressure off me being introverted because uh, I was just asking questions and listening to the answers and then asking more questions. And I found from a fairly early age a bit of that magic dust, if you like, uh, in terms of uh, learning how to ask and learning how to listen to the answers. And I found that was that was relationship building. It's relatively easy to do. You haven't got to make any points or tell any stories. Uh, and you learn a lot from people. And I've learned a stack, as I'm sure you have, from people just by listening to them, listening to their story and how they approach things, how they learn things, uh, or even in networking, asking, do you know someone who might know could help me in this area, you know, a good mechanic or, you know, a good builder? Or Like it's 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 that whole network effect, that whole collaboration effect. I didn't realise it then when I was a kid, but I, I was onto something that I would spend most of my life pursuing. You know, and in this whole podcast journey or whatever you want to say that I've been doing, that's one thing that I've actually learned about people is just, you know, asking questions and letting them talk. And and whether if it's a hot topic or just something random about just, you know, how's your day going or whatever, but you start to learn about people and you learn about what their likes yeah. and dislikes. And and it's really cool. And, is, and like I said, that's if I've learned anything from podcasting, that's kind of one thing is just that you know, I guess trying to speak up a little bit more and just add, not, not being afraid to ask certain questions and be ready to listen to what a person has to say. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I mean, one of the reasons why, why people uh, love podcasts like yours so much is that um, Apple research says that we're having less conversations than ever before. I think they've been making records since 2006 and every year, um, they're measuring how long conversations take place on phones and every year it falls until now the average length of a conversation is around 12 seconds wow. and we're having, less, we're having less conversations and they're getting shorter, like in real life. And the Pew research um, suggests that we've never been less likely to change our minds after we hear something. We're getting more polarised, like in more stuck in our views. Yeah. And I think that's one reason why podcasts are becoming a lot more uh, successful and people like listening to uh, podcasts is they're listening to conversations and they they're having less and less of them in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why people like you and your podcast are so important for people to, to listen to a conversation and learn from it. Because I think we're we're hardwired to learn from conversations that they're 
they're very much part of us, part of how we think and 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 how we live. Yeah, as well. It's to your point. I mean, I I think you said. Did you say it was twelve seconds? Was the average? That's right. Yeah, that, that's the average. So there's a lot that are shorter than that. Yeah, and. and yeah, and a twelve like, second conversation. You can't say a lot in twelve exactly. seconds. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's what I was. It's blowing my mind right now. It's like, what do you just get? Hey and hey, and then that's basically about it. But you know, and 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 I agree with you because that was one thing that I've always felt like before doing my podcast and stuff that you know having conversations were always real short, and I'd rather just send a quick text on my phone. I, you know, I didn't, and nobody wants to call anybody, even during college and stuff when we first started texting people or whatever. Yeah. It's like, why are you calling yeah. me, man? Just text me. <laughs> No, like tell me when you yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's not quite that. I mean, and, and I mean, and and uh, people will say, Yeah, but I use more social media now, I text more, I use more WhatsApp or whatever the app is that you want to use sure. uh, on, your, on your phone. Uh, however, there nothing replaces that conversation. And I, I remember uh, when I was uh, when I first started working. Um, I, I live I live in Manly and I was working in the city. You've got to drive across the Harbour Bridge. And many of your listeners may have heard of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And there's always a big traffic jam as there is in most uh, most uh, most big cities uh, in, at peak hour. And there was a big billboard up near the near the bridge, uh, and it said, uh, "Don't just sit there, call a client." And it was a, it was a it was a um, like a telco ad. And I thought, "Don't just sit, I'll call a client." And I find being in the car in particular. I love making calls from the car. I just call people. Yeah. I'll call clients. I'll call friends. I'll call relatives. And I just find it just, it, it opens up a whole new level of relationship as opposed to texting them. Cause it's, it's really hard to get emotion across in a text. You've got all the little emojis, but why not call them? But, hey, Chris, I was thinking about you, mate. How are you going? What are you up to? You know, I've been too long. Let's catch up. And, and yeah. it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. That's one thing that, you know, I'm, 36 years old. And, you know, and like I said, you know, back in college and even out of college, you know, we just, I didn't want people calling me. I would just rather than text me and I would just go on. And, but, <laughs> and, you know, I'm not calling myself old or anything, but I'm starting to learn and notice the values in having, like, just picking up the phone. And even if it's a 10 minute call or whatever, right. Just yeah, yeah. Friend, it's that person's voice and having a, you know, it doesn't have to be a deep conversation about the meaning of life or what's going on, but just, you know, Hey, <laughs> I'm just thinking about you wanted to call and say, Hey, you know? Yeah. yeah, well, yeah I'm just thinking about you. Just call and say, Hey, if you've got, I mean, uh, women are better at this than men are. And women are much better at relationships right across the board than, than we are, unfortunately. Uh, so, and a lot of guys don't call each other for whatever reason. It's So if you're the guy, I, I like to think, um, I want to be the friend I'd like to have. So I'd like to have friends that call me. So I call my mates and I, I jump in the car and just, I, for some reason I find driving and calling, I don't know what it is, <laughs> some bizarre connection going on there. I always think, okay, I've got I've got 45 minutes in the car, I've got an hour in a car, I'm going to, I'm going from A to B, I'm going to, here's the people I'm going to call on, on this on this trip. Then I just make those conversations and it's just about connecting. Uh, it's, and I think that's what, what that's what podcasts do too. What well, helps pass the time on that car ride too? You start talking and getting a good conversation, and all boom, then all of a sudden, yeah, you're- yeah, 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 and and you learn stuff too. You learn stuff about their perspectives or their issues or what they're facing. Or uh, it's uh, and it's and I honestly believe that the quality of your life is the quality of your relationships. And there's a lot of good research that says that quality conversations and quality relationships oh. go together. Texting, I, I, I mean uh, the. Uh, the, the person to person or even like phone call conversations. Uh, and there's even people like John Gottman um, from Washington State University, I think he is. He's done a stack of research on romantic relationships and how those, the conversations in romantic relationships also are a good barometer to how well it's going on. And you know, the people that you love talking to, you're closest to. And the people you don't like talking to, you're not that close to. It's true. It's a pretty, pretty normal barometer, but it's, it's something we don't do enough of, and that's why I'm on this mission. Unfortunately, it's a mission that you get paid for, <laughs> which is really cool. <laughs> well, which is really cool. And, and this touched a little bit earlier, though, that you know, with these long form of conversations, that you know, you can actually hear why a person thinks the way they think. Kind of what you said, you know, as opposed to where you get on the news right now, like a three minute clip or whatever. And like you know, so if you yeah. were to come on here and say, 
I think every road in the world should be painted blue, right? And, and that, that's all <laughs> yeah. they're going to put on the news. I'm like, well, you know, this Peter guy, he's weird. Why does he want roads painted blue? But on here, <laughs> you know, we get a, a person that could listen. It's like, well, let me see what he's got to say here. You know, maybe he's onto something. Yeah. No, we'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a great point. I think, I mean, one of the podcasts I listen to is Joe Rogan. I think he's the most popular podcaster in the world. He has, like, conversations with people that last for hours. Three hours. And, they're really in, and he's really skilled at having great conversations with people. He's also a lot more intelligent than he makes out that he is. He yeah. sees how dumb he is, but he's, he's very bright, obviously. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, and I learn a lot from those conversations because I'm hearing from people I wouldn't normally have in my everyday life. Yeah. yeah like, you know, people, you know, experts in aliens or <laughs> experts in, in uh, conspiracy theories. And I think I'd never hear from those guys. It's nice to, I don't agree with them, but it's nice to hear from them. Exactly. Yeah, that's how I modeled my show was right after Joe Rogan, because I didn't ever want to pigeonhole myself into one topic, you know, but yeah. I had people always like, why don't you do a fitness podcast or whatever? It's like, well, you know, I don't, I want to talk to people from all different, you know, walks of life, you know, just like you were saying, if they yeah. don't want to talk about aliens or they want to talk about health and fit <laughs> or whatever it is, like, Hey, this is cool. You know? And, you know, and I get to learn yeah. something from it too. And just like, you know, you know, you being a professional at communication where, to, you know, if you would have told me that two or three years ago, there's a professional at communication, you know, what? I would have never known yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's exactly right. It, it's um, it's curious. I also find it interesting that um, uh, one, one outcome of the social media we consume is that we tend to get the algorithms feed us back what we believe already. Mm-hmm. Like if you're on a TikTok or Facebook or whatever your favourite social media platform, we know it feeds us back whatever we follow. Like if we follow a certain football team, it's going to give us news on that football team. And it's going to like reinforce our views and we're going to get more and more of less and less. So we're going to get deeper into a very narrow little bench down here. So it's important to, 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 to broaden that perspective and listen to different sorts of people uh, rather than always the same. Yeah. You know, if you if you put yourself in these echo chambers and just keep listening to, you know, like if you want to go out there and just say all day long about, you know, I think every road should be blue in the world. And then people just find people who agree with you. And then without any constructive yeah, yeah. yeah, you're just going to be like, no, you're just going to go down this road that it's like, what the heck am I? Oh, maybe somebody will finally end up telling you, like, what the heck are you doing, dude? Like, But yeah, it, yeah ex- exactly. Yeah. You need those yeah. perspectives in your life to, in order to grow, like, kind of like what you just said. Yeah, it, it's interesting too. Uh, in uh, a lot of the uh, the work I looked at when I was was doing my masters was on this whole idea of the the wisdom of crowds, which I'm sure you've heard of and your listeners have heard about. Which is this uh, this theory, which has since been proved to be true, that um, if you've got a group of people and they've got diverse thinking, uh, they're going to make a smarter decision than the smartest person in that group. Mm. So if you've got a group of friends or a group of listeners or a group of people in a, in a company. That you're working with, I mean, diversity is a good thing, obviously for ethical and moral reasons, but also you just get smarter decisions uh, at the end of the day if uh, if you're interacting with a more diverse group, uh, and that's this whole idea of thinking of of your life, thinking of your relationships as collaborations, where you think, okay, I'm I'm collaborating with people. It could be a group, it could be a company, it could just be me and one person in a conversation. And they collaborate in a way that leaves us both better off and having the relationship deeper as, as a result. And that's that's got to be a useful thing to explore, at least to consider, rather than just trying to convince somebody of my point of view, which is almost like a sales approach. Like, I, I want you to paint your all your roads blue. So I'm going to sell you blue paint to paint roads blue. Okay. And that's all I want to do is change your mind. But maybe, maybe you're thinking red and maybe red's a better colour you can see it better maybe it's less slippery when there's snow it, maybe it's the whole lot of reasons why red but if, if i'm not listening to red i'll think of blue 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 i'm not getting a better outcome you know it's exactly as a result of the conversation yeah yeah so and yeah, you need those to bounce ideas off one another and and not always and then get into these ideological thoughts that hey i am the smartest person in the room because you know there's you know yeah. the, it's like ceos i get well maybe not all ceos but I've read, you know, heard people on podcasts that, you know, a lot of big time people like to surround themselves with the, you know, yes, man, so to speak. Right. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's always that no matter what they do, no matter what they say, it's always perfect. And there's nobody there to challenge them or do anything to say, well, Hey, but maybe we should you know do it this way instead of that way. I mean, why not? What's it going to hurt? Right. And that, 
yeah. yeah, then they go down these roads that it's like, wait, you know, this is not where I wanted my thoughts and ideas to go, but now and I'm in a bad place where yeah. I can't get out of. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I was um I was listening to an interview with Elon Musk. It wasn't on Joe Rogan, but, but I love the Musk Rogan interview. Right. And he was he was talking about um SpaceX. This is a few years ago, and he said they said, what's making SpaceX so successful? You know, is it, is it your leadership and stewardship? He said, no, no, not at all. He said, um, what makes SpaceX great is that we've managed to attract um some of the the, the leading uh space scientists at at uh, at colleges now because they want to come and work on a space program like SpaceX. So the reason we're so successful is we've, we've got such a diverse group of really smart, what he called kids, yeah. um, coming to join them and helping them build rockets because that's what they want to do. Uh, you look at the research in, in the UK, they did some research of the, of the public listed companies that had the highest rise in profitability over the past decade. And the more diverse their board was, this is getting back to your CEO point, mm -hmm. the more diverse the board was, the more the shareholder value increased, ah, uh, be, be, cool. because they make because the board was making smarter decisions. And, and you get a CEO with like ten people going, "Yes, boss, what a great idea! You're a legend, and I don't worship you." <laughs> You're not going to be that successful, you know. Yeah. And the, the best CEOs I work with are the ones that are most collaborative and actually let go the most, mm. Mm. and, and good. find good people and give, give them give them the job. Yeah, you know. It's like a football team or a baseball team or any team. You, not any one player can do every job on the field. That's the truth. That's the truth. That's yeah. That's the that's the theory. You know, in, in talking and, about uh, Elon and communication and everything, where he just purchased, you know, Twitter for what is it, forty four billion? Yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah, yeah. do you think you know? And now he's wanting to, I guess, basically clean up Twitter into a sense. And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that in the form of just, you know, like, I guess the social media and communications in general? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I agree with what Musk is doing. I agree with opening up Twitter. I, I don't believe that unless it's severe hate speech mm. or like racial vilification or, or like what is basically a crime. So you can't commit a crime on Twitter like you can't anywhere else. But I, I think the more open and diverse Twitter is, the better. And I think that's why Musk has bought it, yeah, to open it up. I, I don't know. All of a sudden, we were just – I was talking about Twitter. It's like we don't, we're not supposed to talk about Twitter and Elon. It keeps kicking. Well, it, 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 you, know, you know what it is, Chris? It's probably Elon monitoring the conversation. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't mind because, him monitoring it. But, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, – no, That's weird. Dropped out twice. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I don't – you say it comes. I've had it come up before on my screen, like, "Hey, your connection's unstable" or something like that. But uh, same, I don't yeah. know. You, that that is very bizarre. Very I don't bizarre. know. Is it, you did that problem, or I, I don't know. I mean, because like I said, I just had a call right before I got on here, and everything was good on my end. So, and now yeah. let's, I got a hiccup going on that I don't know about. But um, I don't know if yeah, it, okay. if, it, if it happens again, then um. Maybe we should just uh, reschedule or something in that way. Yeah, yeah. maybe there's some. Well, I, I don't really understand anything that works. Yeah. And why it can? Well, we can we can keep going. Like I said, if it happens again, then that way it's, it won't keep interrupting our flow. And cool. Um, okay. So yeah, so yeah, we were on the yeah. Speaking of Elon, and we were, I, I guess I was basically just asking you about your thoughts of him buying Twitter and just that. Um, if, if it was good for social media and communication and him opening it up in general, because he's all about advocating for free speech, I think is one of his big things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm all I'm all for free speech. And uh, as we talked about uh, earlier, Chris, we've never been less likely to change our minds. So if we open up the conversation, we'll have a more collaborative society. And the last, um, the last female to win a Nobel Peace Prize a Nobel Prize um, for Science, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, she won it for her work on pro-social collaboration. Uh, and what she did was she uh, she studied uh, farming environments from the Middle Ages right through to the present when people are grazing cattle, they've got their own land, there's also common land. And the tragedy of the commons is when people overgraze the common land. Uh, and it's in our it's in our mutual best interest not to overgraze it, but it's in our selfish interest to, to overgraze it. Yeah. 
Like if, if there's four or five of us each got our cattle, there's, there's one pasture that we can share. We want to we want to keep that pasture alive, basically for all of us. And she looked at this uh, the model of the societies that that worked the best in their common land to overcome the tragedy of the commons. And she called it pro-social collaboration, which meant it's a society that uh, or a group that understands how to share common resources, uh, like the environment, like pastures, like ideas like like people, like neighbourhoods, like sharing common resources and living together. And she won the Nobel Prize. It was all about uh, how um, collaboration, uh, you know, generates pro-sociality. And there's there's a lot of work to be done on, on how we evolved yeah. and, and how homo sapiens like us got forward from the rest of civilization back then, or the rest of the apes as, as we were. And it was about us learning to talk to each other and learning to share ideas and collaborate. So it's you could say it's part of the uh, evolutionary spirit. Uh, so we we will collaborate best when we're listening to more diverse voices and we're sharing ideas with different people, with different perspectives. So the more open Twitter is, the more that facilitates that happening, if you like. So I'm all in favour of it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, no, I don't, I agree with you that, you know, just because a person's, and, and like I said, like you said earlier, that if they are saying things that would, you know, necessarily maybe harm themselves or somebody else, then yeah, I don't agree with the hate speech or anything like that. But, but, you know, yeah. for the most part though, I mean, you got to be able to, if you have different thoughts and you, and you're on a publicly shared social media platform, then why not be able to share those thoughts? And just that, you know, you keep, yeah, yeah. Pressing people, that's not going to help anything. But yeah, I mean, but that was like, you know, that's obviously that's how, you know, America was founded on was free speech. And that's one of the biggest things. And then I exactly. guess, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I'm not here to be advocating as much as free speech and all about Twitter and everything. But yeah, I guess in that my whole point view, I just, I do agree that, you know, when you have these diverse conversations and like to your point earlier about, you know, making these, if you have diverse people around you, you're almost going to be thinking, what higher than the smartest person in the room or however you said it. yeah exactly exactly that's also interesting it's also interesting from a, a motivational perspective i remember um i was uh, catching a flight to the uk right before covid this was what four years ago for us and uh the, the client i was working with uh, gave me a business class seat which was great got the aircraft sat down there was a, a, a woman just a, a, across the uh, aisle from me we started chatting as we we're putting our bags away uh, and she was she was uh, reading reading a book about um, about digging up dead remains. And I thought, wow, this is really concerning. Who am I next to on, the, on this aircraft? Started chatting to her. Sure enough, she's um, she is a forensic archaeologist. Her uh, she was flying to London and then going to uh, uh, part of Eastern Europe. I think it was in Bosnia. She was part of a team that was digging up remains of people that had allegedly been massacred, and she was uh, using those remains to work with some lawyers to put a case in the uh, in the uh, human rights um, tribunal in the Hague to uh, try war crimes. And mm. for a lot of the flight, she was telling me about this. I thought, wow, that is so interesting. And um, her name was Amir Kopp. She uh, had written a book. I think it was called The Bone Woman. Okay. Uh, about being a bone woman and digging things up, I thought this is really interesting, and it, and it just gave me a different perspective. Thinking number one, there's people like her around, which is great because she's an awesome human being. But two, I think you think well, uh, you can have a dream and you can live it, and you you can hear that beat and and march to it. Uh, and it was inspiring. Now, I wouldn't normally be interested in forensic archaeology. It's not something sure. that I would pick up a book on forensic archaeology. But but listening to her, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And now, if I was on Twitter, if, if I was on, uh, say, TikTok or Twitter and all that had been shut down, I'd, I'd only be hearing echoes of my own thoughts, which wouldn't be a great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to get that diverse thinking out do there. You, do you think that? You know, and I there there is good things that come from you know Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all social medias and stuff. And that, but do you think that into a sense that you know it's almost killing or hurt? I don't say maybe I shouldn't say killing, but killing communication and the art of conversation. Because I I've you know, talking about Joe Rogan and stuff. You know, having a conversation with somebody, especially you know like you know 
you and I only exchanged a couple of emails or whatever before we started this. And now we're, you know, we're flowing and, you know, I never really expect, you know, what's going to be the other, on the other end of this computer screen when I start this podcast, <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, we start flowing with ideas and start talking about, you know, Elon Musk and it's like almost a, an art in a way. So do you think, you know, look at <laughs> through social media and the art of communication and conversation? I mean, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's going to hurt people? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm an old guy. I mean, I'm, I'm in my sixties, right? So uh, I grew up with uh, no computers and no social media, obviously. Sure. The first computer I used was when I was what, 19 or 20 and social media didn't really turn up until what, a decade or so ago in any substantial form. So I've lived most of my life without it. Uh, and I've got, I've got five kids uh, all of whom are addicted to it, right? So I, I've got a very there's a very big generational gap uh, in in my in my household, and I think there's lots of great things social media can do. Keep you connected with people that are remote from you or in different countries or in different areas. You can learn things. Like my coffee machine broke down the other morning. I just got into YouTube and oh. typed in the brand of the coffee machine and what the problem was. And there's a guy there telling me how to fix it for free. I'm thinking this is really cool. It's there's you can learn almost anything. You can, you can find out so much. So there's it's overwhelmingly a better place with social media, uh, sure. with, with YouTube, with Google, with Facebook. It's 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 mainly a positive impact. The negative part is I agree with you. We are having less conversations, and I think that might be part of the reason why there's all, uh, as conversations uh, have been falling. We've also had a rise in in depression and anxiety in the world, mm. particularly since COVID, because because COVID has made us more isolated and more fearful. And as we get more isolated, as we get more fearful, we do get more depressed because social and human connection is part of uh, our existence. And if you look at say good positive psychology from people like Martin Seligman, the number one marker for a happy, happy life is good relationships. Number one marker for a great relationship is, is having great, uh, yeah, great conversations and sharing ideas with each other. So it does concern me. And that's that's why I guess I'm on this mission and well, why my mum put me on this mission. It was her, her idea, not mine, uh, <laughs> to make this happen. Uh, and the, the, more, the more down the track I get, the more important I think it is to have these conversations. Well, to your point a little bit earlier, when you were kind of always talking about Homo sapiens and kind of the evolutionary standpoint, that you know, if you want to say human species or Homo Homo sapiens, that we're almost tribal people, and we've always wanted people around us, and that you know, and there's an art to storytelling that you know before computers yeah. and media and radio and everything else, like that was the form of entertainment, you know, to go sit around yeah. wherever and have a great story now whether if it's true or not i don't know i mean you didn't have, you couldn't get on people right there and like let me fact check jim right here make sure he's not lying about that <laughs> <laughs> but like there, there was something to that and and i do agree that you know people need that in their life even though there's a, a lot of people saying like no i don't need anybody i'm a lone wolf or whatever but i think that's a kind of a defense mechanism that they put up with that but yeah i think people need uh, people. yeah yeah, I think that there's there's two great points um, you make there, Chris. One is on stories, and I was reading a book uh, recently on the evolution of the of the brain, uh, and they're talking about the Homo sapiens and the communication, and also storytelling. And what they were saying uh, was that they were looking at caves where there were paintings and drawings on the cave. And that they found that there were these experts in echoing in caves. Can you imagine that? These people spend their whole lives understanding echoes in caves. And, and what they found was that the place where, where the, the, the pictures were on the caves, which we've all seen in, uh, in fossils, uh, they were the places in caves that had the most echo. And, uh, and uh, they were thinking or assuming that the reason the paintings were in the parts of the cave with the most echo was that's where people were telling the story. Like they use it was almost like a, a movie by pointing to the picture and telling the story sure. in the echoiest part of the cave. So the whole tribe or the whole group could really get the really get the story. And again, to uh to receive and give information by story needs a bigger brain. Hence our brains develop from like you know stems at the back right through to the frontal lobes because we needed to communicate. 
and we needed to talk to each other and share ideas until like 1700. There were no books. It was all stories. Yeah. It's all sharing ideas with each other. There's no book. I couldn't give you a book on anything. <laughs> it didn't have a print press like 1700 and something. Yeah. So it's like that's all those years, like a few thousand years of us evolving and sharing ideas, communicating and stories. So if you take that away, you're, it's, it is a concern because we're, we're taking away something that's really part of our DNA. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder – you know, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, but, you know, with the future of, you know, evolution and, you know, taking away part of our DNA that we're almost, it's like we're, we're, you know, you ever seen that, um, that basic picture of an alien, which got a big head, a little skinny body and you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's almost, like we're almost going, hey to, yeah, it's like, we're going to that standpoint where that, you know, we want to be that where we're, we're, we're going to be that way just because we have so much technology and so much stuff that helps us go through everyday life where all we just basically need is a brain in order to, you know, go look something up or, and then all we just need a little, a little device to go text somebody. And, and even with and going on the Elon Musk talk though, you know, what is he wanting to implant a neuro link in, into people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And just, well, you can actually just, what is it? Talk through thoughts for the most part. You, you, you can, I think he's doing it initially uh, for people that have like, uh, catastrophic spinal injuries to help them. I think that's step one. And step two is uh, we'll be able to just think about having a relationship with somebody and they're there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I heard Mark Zuckerberg talking about um, having hologram, having holographic conversations. So there's a hologram of Chris, a hologram of me communicating with each other. Yeah, in the metaverse. <laughs> in the metaverse, yeah. that's <laughs> in, in, in the metaverse and... And I'm not really there and you're not really there, but I, I don't really get that bit. I don't really understand how that works. If I'm not there and you're not there, uh, is it like Zoom, but a holographic Zoom? I, I don't know. But yeah, it's like we have it's a, little avatar, a little avatar in this little area and, you know, we're controlling our avatar, but people are, are kind of almost in a room with us at the same time, you know, listen to you and I have this conversation. So yeah, but I think, you know what? I, I think I, I can't imagine how you'd sell that because uh, other, I've got to respect Musk's selling ability. He's sold, he's <laughs> sold a boring company. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, not going to challenge his sales ability. But I'm thinking, if I want to be with a, if I want to be with my wife, I'd rather me be with her than my avatar be with her. Sure. If I want to, if I want to um, hug my child, I'd rather hug me, real me, hug real her, not. <laughs> Avatar me, hug avatar her. <laughs> um, so I, I can't see how it might be useful, I, um, unless it's better than say zooming. Maybe it's a it's a zoom replacement. Yeah, that's kind of what it's looking like it might be. But you know, and I'm also wondering where you know, like you were talking about yourself in the beginning of the conversation, where you were, you know, uh, very introverted, and that if it's and it's like almost. Because I agree with you that I would rather be physically in a room with somebody, you know, and have a conversation and feed off their energy and their body language and their traits rather than just their avatar, just because, you know, it just just doesn't make sense to me. Maybe that's a little bit of old school to me, but, you know, you know, kids today or whoever you want to say that's been who's grown up with a device or a screen in front of their eyes from day one coming out the womb, you know, is this another yeah, yeah. for them to actually look, OK. I don't do well in these social interactions and maybe I have kind of, you know, social anxiety. So why not? I can use this as a tool and that way I'm there, but I'm not there at the same time. And at least I can have a form of conversation. Yeah. yeah. But, but I guess it's like many things. It's it's like many things. I think, I think you learn to do it just like I did. And like most of us did like learn to talk to people, learn to have those conversations, whether that's a like personal friendship, romantic relationship, a business relationship, uh, it's it's even even though it is innate, it's something that we need to learn to do. And I think you you learn it by doing it. You don't learn by not doing it. It's like learning to drive. You learn to drive by not driving. You learn to drive by by driving and and getting better at it and getting more comfortable in different conditions. And it's a, it's the same the same uh, with conversations. But I I do think I know I think all the research is pointing to the uh, the conclusion that the the rise in depression and anxiety. Uh, is right alongside uh, the disconnectedness that we have with each other. 
this this polarized thinking, this divisive thinking, uh, not having as much human to human uh, conversation. So it's not just educational. I think it's it's also it, it's very evolutionary. It's very much part of how we're hardwired, and it's it's a simple thing to do. It's not very complicated just to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. It, that's sort of hard, and maybe uh, your listeners might want to think about a goal for tomorrow to think, oh, you know what, I'm just going to make one more call tomorrow than I normally would. I'm just going to call somebody. Just one, one call. Next day I'm going to make two calls. Next time I'm going to make three. And just make three more calls a day than you normally would, and your life's going to change, I, I guarantee it, dramatically. Yeah, I don't doubt it. And it's, yeah. it's not, not that hard. Yeah. You know, being – you know, in, in your field, a professional communicator, and that, you know, just like I said, somebody who is might have social anxiety or, or is or afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody and just at a young age, kind of like how you were. Like, but what advice or what tips or whatever you want to say that, you know, you would give them just, you know, like, hey, you know, go take a chance and just start asking questions and start to listen to what somebody else has to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what what I'd suggest, what I'd suggest, and I've looked at this really closely, and and I've also written a whole book on it. But I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the the shorthand the shorthand version. Uh, what I'd suggest is, or well, number one, uh, decide as Simon um, Sinek would say, start with why. The reason why to have more calls and more conversations is your life will be dramatically better and you'll be happier. So there's two great reasons to do it. There's the why out of the way. When you think of the, the how, you think well. I'm going to think about the first thing I'm going to do is for the particular conversation I'm going to have is I'm going to set a goal for the conversation. That, that's the place I'd start. I'd say, okay, I'm going to talk to Chris. So I'm going to talk to Jack. I'm going to talk to Jill or talk to Mary. And my goal is to for something to change as a result of the conversation. I want them to change how they're feeling, change what they're thinking or change what they're doing, change how they're feeling. They're going to feel cared about, feel missed, feel loved, feel whatever, feel rewarded. Uh, so I'm going to call someone to make them feel cared about. You know what? Uh, I call my friend Nigel, mate, haven't spoken to you for a while, really miss you, uh, would love to catch up and just see how you're going. He's going to feel cared about. That's a, that's a caring goal. I might call someone and learn something from them or teach them something. That's a thinking goal. Or I might, uh, it might be a behaviour goal. I, would, I want them to change what they're doing or, or suggest they change what they're doing and help them change what they're doing. So it starts with a goal. But that's where the That's where it starts. Uh, and uh, then you would be connecting with them. Uh, then you would be, uh, if you're thinking about changing something, one of the most worthwhile things for your listeners to do is to really study and care about how they're thinking about that right now, whatever it is. Whatever's happening in their life, just understand how they're thinking and how they're feeling about that, and that will open up a whole new world uh, for people. Because you will, uh, if, if you look at um, exit research, if you look at uh, most business research in commercial relationships, if uh, if any of your listeners are involved in a business or commercial relationship, if they ask customers in a commercial relationship what they want mainly from people that they're doing business with, they say, I want someone that uniquely understands my needs and my environment. So if you can understand them, like what their environment is, what their needs are, how they're feeling and how they're thinking, you've got a huge competitive advantage over anyone else that's talking to those customers. And you're going to get more and more ideal for them and lock in a long-term profitable relationship with them just by caring, just by call, calling them, talking to them and understanding without selling anything to them. Yeah. A yeah. huge benefit. That's been one of the things that I've learned when doing my conversations here. So, sorry, my dog just jumped in my lap. That um, that my goal is to ultimately, when you and I walk away from the pot or turn off the podcast or the Zoom call, whatever, that we both <laughs> feel good about how the conversation went. And even though that, you know, if we have or get on a subject of, you know, a hot topic, you know, uh, something that we both want to group, maybe not agree on, right? But but ultimately that, you know, we can understand your point of view, understand my point of view. I can look at it in your eyes or your shoes, whatever you want to say in that. But at the end of the day, you know, we had a small debate, but if it were to happen and we both walk away, like, hey, I still feel good about that conversation, you know, and that yeah, I, didn't, yeah. Yeah, and I didn't really have to, you know, I didn't really try to use words and just try to demean somebody, but I was actually, oh, okay, you know, and that's what more people need to realize that, you know, I think that you can still have good conversations and even if though both parties don't agree on something that you still can just have a civil grown up debate and 
you know, at the end of the day, just walk away and say, okay, cool. That's fine. But he's still a good person or he, she's still a good person. And we can go on, even yeah. if we don't agree on the same thing, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And in, in a lot of the people I work with, Chris, they're, they're in sales or commercial environments. Uh, they tend to build a business or sell something. And, uh, what what I say, what I suggest and what I've learned is that uh, when you're collaborating with somebody, if it's a customer or a colleague or a stakeholder, uh, any commercial relationship, um, when you're collaborating, it's the opposite of selling. Uh, if you think of traditional, it, it, complete opposite. I mean, if you think of everything you learn in traditional selling, what I'd suggest is the opposite, the complete opposite. Uh, and... Because if you like, you think if you think you think about this, or your listeners think about this, think about the last time you felt like you were being sold to mm. by somebody. What do you do? How do you feel? Well, you feel skeptical. Mm-hmm. You probably distance yourself back from the person. That's me. Do you think I don't, I don't trust this person? And you're going to uh, be less likely to buy from them. And if you do, you think you're going to put downward pressure on prices because you're so skeptical about what they're saying. You just don't trust them. Yeah. Uh, now, if you think of a collaborative relationship, it's the opposite. It's like it's it's you and I working together to potentially achieve an outcome together that we wouldn't have if we didn't work together or didn't have the conversation. And I'm as interested in your outcome as mine because if you if you're a customer of mine or a potential customer. I want I want one of two things. I either want to have a commercial relationship with you that leaves you better off and me better off, or find out why that can't happen, and that's fine, because I, I don't want to sell something to you that won't work. I mean, I've been doing this now since 1998 in this business in 12 different countries for right. lots of different clients, and I. And I've got a lot of the same clients that come back year after year after year because I'm not selling them anything. I'm not teaching their guys to sell anything. I'm teaching them to have better relationships, understand their clients better, and the relationship grows or not. And if if it's not a potential client, that's great. Find out early because too often in these commercial environments, people are pretending to buy from you that aren't ever going to buy. You're pretending to buy and have got any intention of doing so. So find that out early and find out who your real customers are and and get a really deep collaborative relationship with them where you're ideal for them and they're ideal for you and you find that out nice and early that's that's how it works that's the magic if you like of, of the whole process yeah. if there is if there is a, a secret source because uh selling doesn't work mm. do you, it just does not work do you think that's a misconception i guess that you could we should say in a modern world because it seems like everything's always sell 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 learn to sell how to sell how to you know sell anybody on anything you know sell like what is that yeah. that, that movie line sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman in white gloves or whatever right that, that, that that's right that, that's yeah, right or that, I, I think that, you know, the wolf of wall street and gordon golf it's somewhere there's pencils somewhere there's yeah pens. that's what, he, that's what yeah. he's always saying yeah, that's right and he's got that actually he came to australia and i saw him run a workshop on straight line selling i really was curious to meet him and also to see how he how he teaches He's very old school uh, sales method. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And you can see, if you look at, I think Wolf of Wall Street is a great example, like an amplified example of how selling doesn't work. And it, it might work in the short term. Uh, and in, in the short term, you're probably not better off collaborating if if it's like a single instance relationship. Like the other other evening, um, my wife and I went out late in, into the city. We, there was a the, the last ferry was leaving from the city back to Manly where we live. And there was a bit of a crowd trying to get on the ferry, and and I jostled with her a bit to get on that ferry because I I wasn't trying to collaborate. I wanted to get on that ferry with my wife. Otherwise, we're stuck in the city for the evening. And in that situation, I'm better off collaborating. But in every other situation, you're much better off collaborating because you're going to build those long term profitable relationships, and and the clients are willing to pay more for that. Because uh, price is not usually the highest criteria on the list in most uh, most commercial arrangements or engagements. Yeah, yeah. And to your point that yeah. you know, when you build those type of relationships and collab with certain people, that you know, I work in uh in IT. I'll say that, and not to overshare, but you know, I have certain vendors that I go to, and like you know, certain people that you know I want to work with and talk with, and 
like, Hey, the, these are my people. And these are the type of relationships I've built. We know how each other are and, and it, we work well together. And it's not always just saying, Hey, let's try to sell Chris something today. It's just that, Hey, you know, maybe I'm just trying to pick your brain about something and then maybe it might lead to, you know, me, you know, using your business or whatever for X, Y, and Z project that I have going on. So yeah. And that, and that yeah. relationships mean a lot to me and learned that because, and like when you said earlier about the last time, I was being sold something like every time I walk into a department store, you know, immediately they come up to me and like, Hey, you know, I know that's their job and whatever, but Hey, you know, can I help you out with anything? But, and I'm immediately like, let me look, I just want to browse and let me do my thing. I'll come find you. So, yeah, but I, yeah, once I build those relationships and stuff and like, you know, somebody comes to me and wants to, you know, and I learned that's kind of what they're doing. Just like, Hey, I want to learn about Chris and what his needs and wants are rather than just, Hey, I'm here to make a buck, you know? Yeah, yeah, and and what you'll find in in the longer term, uh, if if Chris is if like if if you're my if Chris is my client, uh, Chris is going to buy from me. He's going to he's going to invest in the relationship like I have, and he he is more likely to be a long term client, and we'll, we'll get that long term commercial value from that relationship, uh, and that's that's how it works. Whereas if I rip you off and like sell you or close you into something. Uh, like all these power closures you read about in the books and you see on these YouTube videos. Here's the 12 power closers to use, all <laughs> the, the five opening, uh, five closing questions to use in every yeah. sales environment. Um, I remember uh, back in back in the old days, there was a, um, a guy called Tom Hopkins. He wrote a book called How to Master the Art of Selling Anything. Uh, and he had, a, he had a book about this very structured sales process and a lot of it was about closing and, and closing people that didn't want to buy it's 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 they feel it yeah they feel it uh, and you think well, okay what's the alternative the alternative is to collaborate and uh, and the useful thing is that the alternative is better than the original it it, it works a lot better uh, and it's it's also a lot more authentic chris it's more genuine yeah i relate to a lot to that when i could when i if I, if my senses go off or whatever you want to say that when I feel a person's being truly their genuine, authentic self, that means so much more to me than, you know, just trying to say what I want to hear and stuff like that. It's like, oh, okay. You know, this, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that has a lot deeper value to me. Exactly. And when you've got a good relationship with somebody, you can challenge them. Like if you're a customer of mine and we've got a good relationship and you trust me and you give me a point of view about a product or about a service or about an idea, I may challenge you. Like sure. I, I'll, I'll do it with respect and I, I might change your perspective because maybe things have changed. Maybe there's a, a new product, a new offering, a new way of doing this that you're not aware of and I might challenge you and you're better off that I've challenged you if I do it respectfully. Yeah. Rather, It's not about not about being a waiter like asking you what you want, then giving it to you. <laughs> it's sometimes that, but often it might be, hey, you know, you're aware of this, I, and maybe I can expand the relationship, or maybe it's not going to work. Maybe what I'm offering is not going to work for you. I can introduce you to Jack or Jill or Mary that <laughs> may be a better fit for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Well, cool, Peter. Um, I know we're getting a little short on time here, and I want to be respectful of it. So, uh, But if people want to find you, if they want to find the book or anything you just want to plug in general, what do they do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can't I can't sell it after <laughs> that big diatribe at Andy Selling. <laughs> but if people want to learn more about the approach, um, my book is called Collaboradabra. It rhymes with abracadabra. Hey. Collaboradabra, which is the magic of collaborative conversations. And the book uh, it is the book of the workshop. So you can you can buy the book and like run a workshop for yourself or run a workshop for your friends uh, and colleagues around that. Or you can find me online, PeterAnthonyConsulting.com. I'm on YouTube. I've got a website there. You can learn more about the workshops uh, there um, for your listeners. But I'm, I'm just here to, to talk to you and and ideally give them as much value as I can in our, in our short time together. Well, well, again, thanks for being here. You dropped a good, some good pearls and gems, and I enjoyed it. And I'm glad, I'm glad we did this. Absolute pleasure. Love it to meet you, Chris. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.